This episode of the Chris Johnston Show is brought to you by Sports Interaction Sportsbook and Casino, focusing on the teams, players, and games that actually matter to you. They're not just another sports book, featuring a brand new betting platform with even more ways to bet, including same game parlays, which is an absolute game changer. Plus, Sports Interaction Casino, the best in the market with an insane amount of games and live 24 7 dealers. So, I bet with those American companies who don't understand your city. Sports Interaction. Your homegrown sports book. Bet local. Download the app or go to sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN. 19 plus. Please play responsibly. Uh, I know that some in our audience know the finer points of hockey. The Chris Johnston Show. We are your friends. The biggest stories bringing you inside the game. What did you hear? Powered by Sports Interaction, your homegrown sports book. Always remember to bet local. Here's Chris with your host, Julian McKenzie. Part of the game. Hey, CJ, how did you enjoy your day off on Monday? A very special day for one Chris Johnston. A birthday to be celebrated. Among other announcements that we will get to on the opening of the Chris Johnston Show, a really massive day. Not a lot of people could celebrate their birthday, celebrate their new job, and cover Connor Bedard on the same day. But CJ did it on Monday. Yeah, you say it's a day off. It was the opposite of a day off. I guess it's a day, <laughs> it was a day off from our usual Monday recording of the Chris Johnson show. Exactly, but yeah. A big part of that was because there was barely a free window where we could all align, you, me, and, and uh, producer Nick, to get it done. I, you know, it was a really cool day. It was, I will say, it was actually overwhelming, I will admit, to receive that number of messages. I think it was about 500 messages I received yesterday from people. Obviously, everyone is saying that you know, is it's a great thing. Like everyone is reaching out saying great job or saying nice things to you. Like that's really, really kind, but it, my head was almost spinning, you know, and then you add on to it, just the whole starting a new job, what you, you know, you don't know what you don't know. I'm hearing getting emails from people. I don't know who they are. Obviously they're behind the scenes people at the athletic. It's just like, I felt really out of step yesterday. Like I, like I didn't know almost what I was supposed to do which is weird to say when you're in my stage of my career where kind of by now I, I generally have a pretty good idea what I'm supposed to be doing each day to, in order to have success. But yesterday was like, it was so seismic in my life that it was almost knocked me off balance. But um, man, it's great to feel the love. Uh, if, if you reached out to me, if I didn't get back to you, I'm sorry. I tried to get back to everybody. Uh, and it's so, you know, ultimately I'm just excited, man. I mean, how lucky am I to to get to come and work for a company like The Athletic to, to take my writing there? For those that have asked, everything stays the same otherwise. You and I are still rocking the CJ show on the SDPN. I'm still doing my my normal TV work at, at TSN, Insider Trading. I'll be there trade deadline, for agency day, and everything in between. Um, but it just finally, it does feel right the way everything came together. And I'm really lucky guy. I'm feeling grateful for another spin around the sun with the birthday. And I'm feeling really, you know, blessed to to have a chance to keep doing this as my as my job. Can I just say, when you told me that you were coming to the athletic, I got super, super, super excited. And even like a couple of days before the announcement went live, there was like a little, not really a meeting, but there was a discussion between myself and a few other co-workers who had also heard that you were coming and we were all just excited we we're like oh my god oh my god oh my god cj's coming. <laughs> he's coming oh my god one other co-worker uh mentioned that uh i think they were asked uh you know if there was anyone we could add at the athletic who currently wasn't with us and they said your name and i don't know if they just went off of that but very but all that to say uh you joining uh the athletic and becoming uh you know a teammate well we were already teammates but now we're teammates on two teams uh, this is super exciting. This is super dope. And I yeah, there's a lot of synergy, isn't there? I mean, we're going to probably have a double byline at some point. I don't, I don't, we don't have anything <laughs> in the works. I don't know what the story is, mm. but I think it's reasonable to think, you know, part of, you know, the job that they've hired me to do, I should say, Julian, is I'm covering all the markets, yes. um, you know, obviously tackling, helping with our coverage of the big stories around the league. But, you know, I think that there, there's an opportunity as well, hopefully to, to work with writers like yourself and mm -hmm. combine forces on some stories that really make an impact. And so I'll, I'll tell you what I'm most excited about in all seriousness is just being part of a team, being part of such a, a quality team. I mean, I'm, I'm just trying not to screw things up. I feel like I'm coming in as the third line left winger here and, and our top six is already buzzing. So I, I, I just don't need to, uh, 
to get in the way of anything, but I'm, I'm pumped to be part of it. And it's really like, I hope everyone, no matter what you do in your life gets to have a day like I had yesterday. I mean, I should probably start there just where you hear from so many people. I mean, it's, you know, cause we go all go through life. Everyone's busy. I don't think people always tell you what they're thinking about you or how much they respect you or like you. But then sometimes when there's a big moment like yesterday, I, I think it, it prompts a lot of people to reach out and, and I was floored by the reaction and, and, you know, especially having a birthday, I think you're just reflective in general, just like, wow, like I'm, I'm really lucky to get to this point in my life where I get to do this for a living, like living my absolute dream. Anyone who read my letter or has listened to our pod will know that this mm-hmm. is the only thing I've ever wanted to do professionally and to do it at such a high quality workplace with so many amazing colleagues and everyone being so excited. I mean, like, God, I feel like I'm bathing in good vibes right now. I got nothing, uh, nothing but love being sent my way. Who was the coolest person to reach out to you yesterday? I heard from an NHL GM and I just won't name him because obviously it was private, but he said, what do you, how do you put it? He said something like, you're like the new Mike Keenan. Like how many places do you work? How many people are paying you? <laughs> Mike so I Keenan. Thought, I thought that was funny though. Just sort of chirping me. Um, <laughs> but obviously heard from a few GMs and agents and, I mean, really people right across the industry. I heard from the, the actually the interesting part is because, you know, I'm getting older here, man. I heard from like some people like that I went to high school with, like people that I'm not in regular contact with anymore. Yeah. I mean, obviously the athletic has a massive reach, you know, with the, you know, the sale to the New York times, pretty prominent publication. So like even people I wouldn't have expected just because I've kind of fallen out of touch with them. Time goes on. Like, I can't say there's one person, but I, I like that I was getting chirped a little bit. I uh, had a few funny memes sent my way from people. So, I mean, in all seriousness, I just, I'm really happy never to have to get a real job. I'm I'm trying, trying my best to, cause it doesn't feel like work doing this, even in, though it's obviously long hours and nights and weekends and travel, blah, 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 blah. We don't have to live there too long, but like it, I no. love it. And so to, to join the athletic just feels right. Uh, it's been a long time coming. Uh, I could probably say this since it's my own podcast. I spoke to them a few times in the past about jobs and for one reason or another, it never worked, but um, you know, third time was the charm. We'll put it that way. I was about to say, man, like there was a, there was a time when I thought, Oh, you know, I mean, around the time we were about to meet, I thought it was going to happen, but it didn't happen. But uh, yeah, thank God it happened. Like now, you know, like I, it's, I, it's been a I long actually time believe things happen for a reason though. Like absolutely, I, because I mean, first of all, I think it's indicative of the fact that we twice talked pretty seriously about jobs that didn't happen, that that both sides were still eager for a third conversation. I think that that says something about the nature of those discussions. And, you know, the first time was tied to the fact that I had, you know, my job. I was working at Sportsnet and getting to do Hockey Night in Canada, and I didn't want to give up um, my spot on Hockey Night in Canada at that point in time. The second time, there was a lot more moving parts and just wasn't wasn't quite the right fit in that moment. Um, But it's, there's no question from my end. And I don't think from there is really that this is the right place, the right time for us. And um, I'm just, I'm excited to get in there, get, you know, I got lots of story ideas. I got lots of meetings with the bosses and, you know, start trying to add to the good work that's being done, the great work. I mean, all my favorite writers already work at the athletic. Like it seems a little surreal that I can get to join them. And uh, as I say, just, just trying not to disrupt the, the rhythm of the team because the team's off to a pretty good start. How often are you going to be writing? I don't have an answer for that. You know, I, I didn't sign or have discussions that were tied like to a certain amount of output. I would expect mm-hmm. a lot. Obviously it's a, it's my full-time main employer. Um, you know, I'll be doing a lot of, you know, helping out with like the trade boards and things that I've done in the past that I know the athletics been doing, uh, writing some features, contributing on news coverage, as, as breaking news happens, I'm sure as we get closer to the deadline, there'll be a lot of mashup opportunities about what teams are thinking of doing. I mean, I'm what I'm excited about too is it's not it's not a job. I don't feel very boxed in. I actually feel like there's a lot of opportunity to do a lot of different things. And so I'm sure there's some weeks that means many, many bylines. There could be some periods where it's a little quieter from working on a bigger picture story. Um, but, you know, I want to be prolific and I want to, you know, have an important voice there and, and, you know, I'm excited to, to do some good work. Um, 
one other thing, and if there's anything else you want to mention about the new gig, please mention it. Uh, what is the likelihood of a CJ show, the athletic hockey show crossover? I, I mean, you tell me. I, I, I don't know. Who, like, I don't even know who I would talk to about that, but I'm certainly, uh, I'm certainly game. I mean, we already got you here, and uh, I know you're a big part of the athletic show, hockey show. Um, you know, the one thing that was mentioned, you know, when we were talking about the job is that I would be making some regular appearances on that show. I don't think anything's written in stone, but I mean, it only makes sense that we would uh, combine forces in some way down the line here. All right. Anything else, anything else you want people to know about the output of, of what you got going on? Anything else with the job? We want to make sure that people know what's up. And again, to reiterate, as you mentioned earlier, we're not going anywhere. The CJ show still very much going to be a thing. Well, I th would only say the obvious. If you're not sur already subscribed to The Athletic, first of all, what have you been waiting for? But secondly, this is your opportunity because, uh, you know, we're going to be very pro-athletic around here with both of uh, us working there. So get uh, get uh, subscribing. Uh, I mean, there's so much great work. As I say, I'm sure everyone knows what it's all about at this point. I mean, there's a point in time, right, when everyone joined, it's like, why I joined The Athletic? And people had to, like, give a reason. Now it's almost like, those letters aren't needed, even though I did do an intro letter at, at the urging beautiful of the company. Red. It was but, beautiful, by the way. But I'm just saying, like, it, there's almost it's almost comical because, like, why wouldn't you join the athletic? I joined the athletic because they they called me and they offered me an awesome job, and like, why would I miss that opportunity? So, I'm excited about it, and you know, I love that we're starting off. And you and I have a puck doku challenge right out of the we gate do. here. We do. I'm excited. About I filed that. my my game. Oh, you did. Yeah, it, it's actually going up Wednesday, October 18th. Um, please go to puckdoku.com. And, and this is what we decide on. Taylor and I, from Puckdoku, I want to make sure I get the language right. But Julie and I are doing a competition. Mm -hmm. And the winner will be decided actually by the lowest average uniqueness from the day that we, we have the game. And so I've, I put a game in. I put a lot of thought into it. There's actually... There's sort of a theme to my game. I don't think it's too, too obvious. I'm sure some of you are smart enough, keen enough to guess what it is. But um, look for that Wednesday and then look for Julian's board next Wednesday. And uh, the lowest average uniqueness wins the CJ Show Puck Doku Challenge. And I'm excited put, for that. Should we put like more, more to this? Like whoever has the lowest average uniqueness score, like... I don't know. Like we, when we're in Toronto, one or the other pays for dinner or something. Like, should, should we make? Should we, uh, should we amp the stakes? Sure. I want to make you eat a poutine hot dog. Again? I don't know where we get one though. The Jays aren't playing, so I was about to be like, again, we gotta do this again. <laughs> we could think of something else. We could think of something else. Like we could. Okay. I'm well, sure you name we... the stakes. You name the stakes, and I will abide by them. I will virtually shake your hand on it bet we will we will we will get to those stakes as soon as we can get them uh also on the other side of uh you can bet that uh i want to know more about uh the actual hockey portion of your day involving uh covering uh, chicago versus toronto and Connor bedard and i'd love to have a discussion with you on him and uh, ryan reeves and some other news and notes around the nhl and we'll get to some questions for ask cj it's all part of the game Welcome to You Can Bet That with David Bastel. I see the fancy new setup behind you. That's, that's looking pretty good, my Thanks, man. Buddy. Really, really good. <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to bring 100% all the time. Yeah, I'm on location, but uh, you know what? It, it's, it could be worse, right? It could be worse. Uh, it could always be worse. <laughs> uh, we're not into that today. Remember to hit up sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN for all of your gaming needs. DB, let's talk about Austin Matthews. Six goals in uh, three games. He had the back-to-back hat tricks. Could have had a seventh goal in that third game, but they waved it off. It was a really weird last minute with all these offside reviews. Uh, what do we got on SI with Austin Matthews today? Yeah, and of course, uh, as soon as he comes out to this blistering start, just like the Leafs, pretty good start, two wins. They lost to Chicago on, uh, on Monday night. Um, so you start to see these Leaf props prop out of everywhere for lack of better words and and one that's actually pretty popular right now at sports interaction is austin matthews 50 goals in 50 games you get it at about 25 to 1 which is pretty good value considering the the massive head start he's off to but cj as you know you know he he can go into these dips where it's a couple games and he's not always going to come back with three goals the next night or or anything of that nature but i don't know at, at 25 to 1 it it seems like a like a reasonable flyer 
yeah, that's not crazy to me. I mean, we, we all, we all know having watched the league and so many great goal scorers, 15, 50 is really, really tough. I wouldn't say it's likely for anybody, but when you're talking with someone with Austin Matthew shot his history, his start, uh, having, you know, put a few goals in the bank here, 25 to one. Like, I feel like, I feel like there's value in that play. I yep. really do. Um, who knows? I also think he's motivated. You know, last year was a down year for him. And it's not to say he wasn't trying last year or anything like that, but he looks healthy. And I think, you know, with the season McDavid had getting to 64 goals, I could see him really putting the, the pedal down. So this, this, this is not a crazy proposition to me. No, and there's a couple other ones too. We've added uh, Maple Leafs to win the President's Trophy. Maple Leafs, of course, still the favorites in the Atlantic Division. So, uh, you know what? Uh, one of our big customer bases, of course, in Ontario. And so you're going to get the Marner, Matthews, Nylander props coming out. And uh, we try to cater to those Canadian markets. Uh, um, and we, we look forward to also October 24th coming up. Every single NHL team will be in action on that night. I just wanted to promote that right now because we're coming out with a massive contest and the three of us will talk about that another time, but something to consider because we're, we're creeping into the end of the month, so to speak. So we're really looking Good. forward to it. And the league's doing the staggered starts to those games. I think yes. the Leafs start at 6 PM that night, Thank which will, you. which will be interesting. It's going to be, that's going to be pretty cool. It is all the more reason to be excited for October 24th. Don't forget to check out sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN for all the best odds before game, in game, and the best props. Sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN. DB, thank you. Thanks, guys. Okay, we've already addressed the athletic. We addressed your birthday. Connor Bedard was in Toronto on Monday. And uh, Chicago getting a win over Toronto. Uh, no hat trick for Austin Matthews. He got back-to-back -back hat tricks in the first two games of the year. I want to talk about Connor Bedard. I know he didn't get a point in that Monday game, but I'm really fascinated with the discussion that's starting to brew around him with regards to the media access and availability or lack thereof in the case of Toronto, where he wasn't available on the morning of game day and post game. And, and Taylor Hall spoke about some of the coverage around him too, basically saying it's starting to get a little bit much. And I'm just curious about, how you feel about all of that like are we at a point where we are covering this player too much or or not as much or, or how do you feel we're we're handling that well i don't think he's being covered too much i mean look at the early returns right the first game on espn uh his, his nhl debut in pittsburgh set records for them um yeah i think if you look at impressions and things online like i think there's a huge amount of interest in Connor bedard but i do think that there's a a conversation to be had about what, you know, the NHL can do, what the Blackhawks PR team can do or management team in order to protect him. And I think that they're still finding their way. I mean, look, you're talking about a player who just turned 18. He was 17 uh, when he was drafted uh, by Chicago at the end of June. And, you know, he's, I, I have to say, I mean, he's extremely agreeable as uh, a media interview subject. I mean, if you think back to the world juniors last year, when he was, having six points a game and became this massive story. You know, he was speaking every day. I know early in his career here, just th this first week and a half, he's done everything asked of him. He's been mic'd up in a game. He's doing after period interviews, after game interviews with the, the rights holder broadcasters, in addition to the, the sort of normal media availability with, with, with the reporters in those markets. And so, you know, I don't think this is a, there's certainly nothing. I don't think there's any criticism to be levied whatsoever in his direction. Hmm. You know, where you get some noise is that he came to Toronto, uh, where there is a big media market here um, with my colleagues. And, you know, doesn't speak at all before the game on Monday. The, the Blackhawks did practice in, in Toronto on Sunday afternoon, and, and he spoke then. But, you know, I think reporters are accustomed to coming to the arena on game day and getting a chance to speak to someone like this, especially, you know, this will be Connor Bedard's only visit to to Scotiabank Arena this year. And yeah, I think that there's some some people that are sour about that. Now let's let's lay everything on the table here. I, I you know I'm a vice president with the Professional Hockey Writers Association. So I'm I'm not any comment I have on this isn't meant to represent the the writers generally or even the writers in Toronto, even though I was you know there for the game. This is my personal opinion. I can understand what Chicago's doing. Like I 
you might not like it selfishly because maybe you had a story in mind that day and you wanted some comments or you wanted to, to get a little bit more color around what's going on or context. But I can understand to a degree. First of all, Chicago wasn't at the rink on, on Monday morning. Like their team wasn't there. So there's no pregame avail in that regard. I guess they could have maybe had reporters sometimes, you know, depending on what availabilities are. Sometimes you go to a team hotel and, and the player or, or their coach or manager might be made available in that setting. And then, you know, in the game itself, it was the first NHL game of Connor Bedard's very young career. He didn't have a point. And I think the PR staff wanted to highlight the players that were part of a big win for their team. And, and so he didn't speak. I, like, I get, I do understand wanting to shield him. I really do. But, you know, let's face it. The, the story on October 16th in Toronto wasn't about a 4-1 win for Chicago. It was about, you know, this player playing a game in that market. Um and then, you know, part of that wasn't told. And so, you know, I don't know how you feel about this, Julian. I, I'm, I personally can't get that fired up about it, but it's probably because I'm an older guy now. I've just seen enough. You know, I, I heard a lot of my colleagues, you know, in the press box last night saying, like, in the NBA, this wouldn't happen. You know, like that LeBron James speaks every day or, you know, I know the Spurs have a first overall pick that, that I guess is pretty personable. I don't follow the sport enough to, to you might know a little bit more about that, but Victor Wimbayama, like he's, yeah. he's like to, to not to kind of hijack it, but like Connor Bedard well, is seen as like a generational prospect in the NHL. Victor Wimbayama is seen as a generational project uh, prospect in the NBA. And I don't know what the media coverage is, is specifically with, with his availabilities in San Antonio, but like we were seeing this dude everywhere before he was getting drafted and the coverage around him was pretty normal expected. I mean, this dude's like seven, five, this dude right. is, is, is going to do crazy things in the NBA for years to come. So I think when the Connor Bedard stuff was kind of coming around, I saw a lot of people be critical in the fact that we're seeing other leagues hype up prospects and, and the media attention around them is swarming. And then in the NHL, we have, we have players who are saying, no, we don't, we don't want that for this kid. And P and I've seen some people say that, oh, well, that's just why the NHL's mentality is what it is and why it's second rate. And I don't know. There's like a part of me that looks at Connor and acknowledges that he's a teenager. He's barely 18. And it's a lot to handle all those microphones in your face and to do all these media availabilities. But it seems like he is, as you said, doing everything that's being asked of him and, and going above and beyond. Like, I didn't think he'd be on a show like the Pac McAfee show, to be quite honest with you. At the same time, though, like he's got to he has to go through that coverage. Everyone who's been in that position has had something like that, especially with the talent that he has. Well, and everyone's looking at it a different way, right? Like the, the Toronto media or some members of it are probably looking at it like this is his one day here mm -hmm. this season. Like this is this is the story like this is their thing. Whereas I'm sure the Blackhawks PR team, keep in mind, this team has yet to play a home game yet this year. They've been on the road since, you know, last Monday um which is a long time away and mm -hmm. dealing with a lot of a lot of stuff they're looking at like how do we manage how do we manage this one day for this kid like how can we maybe make it a little better and and here's the truth for those that, that haven't been in our roles julian like it it is not uncommon for reporters that cover a team on a daily basis to almost make kind of deals with the team in, in a sense that like players that are in high demand it might be like okay you know you speak to them today but tomorrow will be an off day or you know like like that kind of thing happens, you know, when the Leafs had uh, Matthews and Marner and Nylander all play as rookies, uh, Lula Morello was a general manager that season. They had a rule that those players couldn't go on the broadcast. They couldn't do those after period interviews you see, or the, really? the over the board interviews, they were restricted. The Leafs actually still have that rule for their rookies. It's not as, it's not as big a deal now with respect to Matthew Nyes and Fraser Minton, but they don't have the kind of rookies that maybe were in the kind of demand, especially, you know, Austin Matthews and, and Mitch Marner were, you know, Matthew scored four goals in his first game and didn't do an interview until at, like after the game was done. He didn't do anything special with the broadcast, for example. <clears throat> and so that's how the Leafs managed it at the time. I don't think this is anything new what Chicago is doing. I don't think it was anything personal against the Toronto media in this case. I think really it's more a fact that they went through Pittsburgh and everything that was opening night. They played back to back in Boston. They went to Montreal. They had a practice day there. He was available there. They had mm -hmm. Saturday hockey night in Canada in Montreal, all the exposure that comes with that. They came to Toronto on the Sunday. He was available. Then Taylor Hall spoke to the media, uh, Donato, Luke Richardson, the head coach of the Blackhawks. And I got the Monday and I think they were like uncle uh, because of <laughs> everything they'd been through leading up to that. And so I think, 
I think it was more a collision of things than any malice. And look, I'm not going to tell any of my colleagues like I, they can be critical of, of Chicago or Connor Bedard if they've wished. Like, like I, I mean, it's all fair game in the fishbowl, but, but I'm just saying personally, and I'm not speaking for anybody. I don't think it's really that big a deal. I, you know, he is 18. It's, it's a tough start. Like, I don't think as much as I was hyping this up, like two weeks ago before the season started, like how crazy is this start to his career? The more I've thought about it, it's really a difficult thing. Um, you know, what the schedule makers handed, handed Chicago and, and Connor Bedard. And um, so I think they're managing it as best they can. And and so that's, that's sort of my piece on it. I'm sure I'm going to have some of our colleagues like, come on, come fight for us. We need this, this access. And I would love the access. I mean, I was, I was there in the dressing room last night, you know, hoping that Connor Bedard would speak, but I can, I can understand how they got to the point where he didn't. Uh, by the way, with that schedule, I keep saying this, they go through all of those games, Boston, Pittsburgh, Montreal, Toronto, Colorado caps off that road trip and their very first game at home against Vegas. Like that is not an easy stretch to start. I, I appreciate it for the media standpoint. It is not an easy stretch for Connor Bernard. Well, and I think the game in Colorado is at like eight 30 at night too, or something like it's like a weird start time and they fly back and they land at 4 AM and then they're playing mm-hmm. like, before they play that Vegas game. I mean, look, and, and I'll say this, Chicago's actually had for what we expected that team, a pretty strong start to the year. I know internally Nick Felino gave a, a little speech after they were losing in Montreal saying like, let's finish this road trip, you know, above 500, three and two. So they're two and two going into the game in Colorado. They got a chance to do that. I mean, that's, that's what's interesting to me, honestly, probably the most interesting thing that happened in the last 48 hours is that Taylor Hall unprompted, to the reporters after their practice mentioned that Bedard's doing too many interviews and, and too many in-game things. And you know, that, that, that came from obviously a player who's played in the Canadian market. who was a former first overall pick, a former hard trophy winner, you know, someone who's, who's been around the league a few spins and, and frankly, who was acquired by Chicago to be a mentor to Connor Bedard, along with guys like Nick Felino and Corey Perry. I mean, they, they brought Taylor Hall in, uh, you know, Boston had a cap situation in, in the off season and, and the Blackhawks, took the opportunity to bring him in because of all he's been through. And I think the way he can be a leader. And so I wonder if some of the conversation now is being driven from the bottom up versus, you know, management or even, you know, the PR staff saying we have to manage this. I mean, maybe it's the players themselves that are saying like, let's, let's give Connor a break here. And, and, you know, water will find its level. I mean, first of all, if you play five road games out of the gate, that, now you're going to have a steady diet at home at some point. And I think that he'll be a little less novel around the league. Like he will have been everywhere and, and you know, you get it now. Like I, I know Sidney Crosby and Alex Ovechkin and even Austin Matthews, you know, Mitch Martin, these guys, the uh, Connor McDavid do tons of interviews and they'd still have demands on them, but I think it's more normal to see them and, and they do get some more days off. And I, I think that that will come in time for Bedard here, but um, you know, it's kind of intriguing. It's a new media world too. There's more things that he could be doing. You know, you're seeing a lot of the content rollout that was done at the media tour in Vegas, you know, wh- whether he's on a couch with Colby Armstrong or, or you know, talking to, to Sidney Crosby on ESPN. And, you know, it's it's been a lot. I think I think it's fair to maybe want to pull back a little bit. Um, and who knows? Maybe maybe a, a nice byproduct for it is, is pissing off the Toronto media. I know everyone outside <laughs> Toronto, uh, Toronto loves to pick or the rest of the league loves to pick on Toronto. Oh, yeah. Poor Toronto. The last thing I'll just say about this is center of the universe. Right, Julian? I'll just say this is this was interesting to me from from Patrick Johnston from the province. I think Connor Bedard, including that uh, game against the Leafs, only three national games uh, for him on Sportsnet this year. There's like two other games in January, including one against uh, Vancouver and another one against Calgary, which will be on the Saturday. So that would that for my guess, I'm circling whatever date that is as like his after hours, like debut, as far as I'm concerned, because that'll probably be the late game. So I can understand for sports that too, and not to pick on one specific outlet, but like, if you're only going to get that type of player so many times on your broadcast, like you, you milk it for what it's worth. Right. And, and look, sports that did get Connor Bedard pregame last night. Like they, they got him, they Sean, Sean McKenzie did an interview with him in the hallway before the game. So he, he still did, some some media for the broadcast it just was the the general reporters he didn't he didn't meet you know i wonder about the 
the significance of national these days? Like, because every game is available if you want to see it anyway. You know what I mean? Like, I, you know, part of what used to make national so significant is that, like, that's for some teams or some players, that was sort of the only time you got to see them. But, I mean, let's face it, if you want to watch pretty much anywhere in the world, if you care about, like, a Connor Bedard game against St. Louis on a Tuesday night, you know, like a game that isn't being hyped up as some big thing. Like you can still watch that game. You can watch him. I'm, I'm not saying national doesn't matter because you, there's there's more eyeballs on those games. But I think we're moving towards a world where every game is sort of national or international. We just need to drop those blackouts. Yeah, I that was that was literally what I was about to say because there are some people who are listening to what you're saying and they're like, huh, that's not necessarily the case for everybody. Like, I think it's ridiculous that blackouts still exist. And if I want to watch any game, I should be able to watch any game without having to go to some illegal streaming site. Not that I do that, but I'm just saying, like, it's just like, <laughs> not that we're endorsing that. Not that we're endorsing that. It's just like, I think it's ridiculous. Like, I, I, I saw a friend's tweet the other day, uh, and I get it's not sports that, but they were trying to watch like a game on like TSN. And they were saying that, like, dude, there were all these games that were supposed to be available on some of the different TSN channels. And region, just because they weren't in those regions, they could not watch any of those games. Like, that's ridiculous. You should be able to grow that product and have, like, there are fans of Canadian teams specifically across the country. And they should be able to watch whatever team they want to, no matter where they are at in this country. Like, it's ridiculous. Well, I know I've worked for every media company, it would seem like. But I still don't always know how it all works behind the scenes, to be honest. But I have to believe we're going to get to a day where like every game is maybe even produced by the league itself mm-hmm. and is just distributed in different ways. But like, I, I think we'll get to a day where like regional and national distinctions aren't that important. I mean, it's only natural to me. Like, so I was riding the subway home last night from last night's game, Julian, mm-hmm. for those not in the Toronto market, Toronto has recently got Wi-Fi on the subway and I was watching the end of the Cowboys game on my phone legally on underground on the subway. Like, I just feel like that's already, that exists today in 2023. And, and I'm anyone who knows me well knows I'm not that tech savvy. So I figured that out uh, and was able to do that and big win by the Cowboys for my birthday. Whoop, whoop. Uh, but I'm just saying like, clearly where all these networks are going is you're going to be able to watch any game anywhere at any time, if you're willing to pay some amount of money for it. And, and, I, I we're we're definitely not there in the current media environment, but we're not that far off new TV contracts, and I think a, a, probably a reimagined sports media industry. And and look, even with what we're seeing in the U.S. Um, with some of the regional networks having trouble going bankrupt, you know, I think that it's going to force some change to how things are done. So if I tread any farther than that, I'm going to say something dumb because I really don't understand how it all works. But yeah. I just think logically from ten thousand feet. I recognize there's a lot of logistical challenges that have to be overcome in that, but but it only makes sense that every game will be available everywhere in time. Okay, before we get to some other news and notes around the league, I have another Leafs question for you. Mm-hmm. Ryan Reeves, there seems to be a debate about his usage and his importance to the Toronto Maple Leafs. Like he's he's a guy who seems to be good in the room. He's going to try to, you know, show off the knuckles every now and again. He's already gotten to a couple scraps. He is not an analytics darling. But then again, he was never supposed to be an analytics darling. I believe uh, the Jesse Blake Sports Report, uh, their latest episode, they uh, address the Ryan Reeves debate. Where do you stand on Ryan Reeves, the Toronto Maple Leaf, and his contributions to the team? Well, anyone who's like measuring his contributions by the expected goals metric or Corsi or anything. And and look at, I'm not anti-analytics in any way, but I think Ryan Reeves has played what? Almost 900 games in the league. I believe <laughs> like we all know what he is. I, I, the Leafs didn't bring him in to make their fourth line have more opportunity at scoring goals. So I think it's pretty clear the swagger he brings. It's pretty clear that he's willing to take care of team teammates on the ice when the situation calls for it. He's a big personality. He's pointing at his biceps on opening night and getting a reaction in the Leafs management box from Brad Trilliving. Like he's here in Toronto to do a specific job. And I think he's doing it now, whether or not that matters or will matter. Like, I don't, I I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I, I do think it's, it's worth saying that if you're not going to change the Leafs core, which obviously they didn't do in the off season, it's not to me completely irrational to try to, 
do things that might bring something new out of the group. Because if, if you're basically going back into the, another season with the same group, you're looking for answers around that group. And, and there's so much focus even today on like, I, I get questions when I do radio hits and stuff locally about like the Leafs third line isn't scoring any goals. So it's like, okay, the Leafs have 13 goals through three games. So scoring is not a problem for this team. Uh, do you know what the problem is? They've also allowed 13 goals through three games. I mean, I think yeah, ultimately they're, well, it just, especially early in the year, they're not the only team and, and maybe the goaltending has been a bit off. Like I'm not, I'm not sounding any alarms yet on the group, but I think to me, management didn't look at this team and say, we've got to bring in like third and fourth tier scoring options. I think they're trying to bring in players who do some different things. And Ryan Reeves unquestionably does that. Obviously the length of the contract for the kind of player is at the AG is a three-year deal uh, over a million dollars per year. Like that, I think you can debate like, wow, that's that, that was more than I think most people thought he would get. But yes, but, but I, if I'm willing to, to put that aside, I, I think it's, I think it's a smart play to, to see what happens here. And I, I guess the elephant in the room would be if, if he ends up playing on a line, that's completely caved in that the Leafs can't even put out there because they're having so many chances or goals against, then it's a problem. But I, I think so far in the season, yes, the expected goal metric is not strong. Um, but he's fighting, he's bringing life to the game. He's bringing life to his teammates. I think he's pushing some people behind the scenes out of their comfort zones. We'll see how that pays off, but that's the bet or that's, that's the, that was the triangulation. That was the thought of signing him with the Maple Leafs. So I've got no issue with the player. I think that he's brings a little different spice to the team. And the one thing I'd say about his contract is that if he gets to the point where they can't put him on the ice, whether it's this season, next season, or the year after, there are other ways to get rid of the the deal. I, I bet he's a really fun quote, huh? I'm jealous. Oh man, he's a huge personality. And look, it's a long season, right? Like I, I think we have to keep in mind, like you need different people to spice up a group. To, and the Leafs have tried this with lots of players in the past, right? They signed Joe Thornton, who brought a certain element. They, you know, they've, they, they've, they've done, they've attempted to make this work, but I. I think after three games, which is where we're recording now, like I, I just can't comment too deeply on whether it's working or not. I mean, I, I think he's, I think Ryan Reeves is doing exactly what Ryan Reeves has done. The fact he's almost at 900 career games tells you that what he does and has done is valuable to lots of different teams. You know, he's played in St. Louis, Pittsburgh, Vegas, the Rangers and the wild off the top of my head. So lots of different organizations have found what he does appealing, have, have traded for him or signed him to, to free agent deals. And I don't think it's crazy for the Leafs to try to, to build a team that maybe is a little bit better at chaos. You know, I, I and, and I know all the counter arguments, like someone right now is like walking their dog, listening to this Julian. And they're like, yeah, but he won't be able to play in the playoffs. She won't be able to trust him and blah, 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 blah. I do think the Leafs need to build a team with more backbone when it comes to those tough playoff games. And that doesn't necessarily mean fighting. Obviously, there's not a ton of fighting in today's game, but I think that they need more of an edge. I think you saw that. Certainly, if you want to go on narratives, Florida and Vegas had lots of players that kind of, you know, excelled at what we might call the dark arts, you know, getting away with things, you know, playing tough, playing on the line. Um, you know, I think Ryan Reeves can help the Leafs in that regard. It's never about one player. It's about getting a team that's willing to do that. Ultimately, you want your top players to have a certain – like they're not going away kind of resilience into their game. And so I think that they're, the Leafs are trying to build that culture in part with a player like Ryan Reeves, who might be one of the biggest personalities in the whole league. All right. Uh, 79 more games to go for the Toronto Maple Leafs and uh, more opportunities. But I don't Ryan hate the Reeves signing. I got to say that like, like okay. everywhere I go, I, I feel like it's everybody else is saying, this is a horrible signing. I don't hate the signing. I think the Leafs can use a little bit of chaos. Like I think, a bit of fights and stuff like that after scrums. Like, I think they have to get used to that because that stuff all happens in the playoffs and the, the proof will be in the pudding, so to speak over, you know, many months from now. But I, I think that you're going to see just knowing Brad true living's past and, and history. I think you're going to see more of that. I think the blue line will look a lot different and they're going to bring in more players that can play in that certain style to try to help them have success. Let's go around the league and talk about some other storylines. I want to start in uh, Vancouver, if we can, with uh, Connor Garland. We know there's been some talk uh, about him possibly being moved. Where are we at in uh, with that story? 
Well, it's sort of an interesting story, right? Because the, the, the trade, so there hasn't been a trade request. I think it's just at a point where, at least not in a formal sense, where the team, you know, has, look, at been trying to move Connor Garland probably going back a year, maybe a little longer um, for cap purposes. We know the Canucks have had a real cap squeeze. And, and you know, ever since, you know, Patrick Alvin and, and Jim Rutherford, um, took over that organization. They've been looking for ways to ease that. They haven't had success in trading Connor Garland. So what's happened in the last week or so is Connor Garland changed agents to Judd Moldaver, pretty prominent figure in the industry now who represents Austin Matthews, uh, Connor McDavid, um, you know, Zach Wierenski, Roman Yossi, a number of other players. You know, I'd say probably he's tracking, if he's not already there, to being probably the most impactful agent in the game. And so Connor Garland makes that move in part because he wants Judd to, to, to try to help find him somewhere else to play. And where we're at right now in this moment is I think that's in a bit of a holding pattern. Um, you know, Connor Garland might be open to a change. I think the Canucks might be open to making that trade, but finding a trade partner a week into the season maybe isn't as easy. I think the urgency on the other end for teams that are at least, you know, curious here to, to pull the trigger on a trade is not that high. Everyone still likes their team, right? More or less. Um, and injuries haven't piled up and all sorts of things. I mean, there's a reason why trades don't typically start happening in the NHL until around U.S. Thanksgiving, which is still a month or more away from where we are today. But, you know, it sounds like there's maybe five or six teams um, that at least have enough interest to want to engage in some conversations. You know, I, I count among them Nashville, Washington, uh, Columbus. I think Carolina uh, – at least is willing to explore there again. I don't sense that the teams though have the same desire to just like make this trade. I mean, we'd be talking, we'd probably be breaking down how the trade looks if it was that simple because the Canucks are ready to deal. And, and I think Garland would, would welcome a move. So, you know, I think it's something we'll keep our eye on Julian. You know, Garland's got this year and two more on his contract. The Canucks know they're going to have to retain salary in this deal. And, and I would expect they'll do so. And I do think it's going to happen, but it, you know, it just seems to me, you're either going to need one of those teams to get really excited about making a trade, which could happen. I mean, some of those teams are off to a slow start, not scoring a lot of goals might be like, Hey, this is, this is the injection we need, or maybe an injury or something might change their outlook. Um, you know, but certainly I, I do think you're going to see Garland moved on from Vancouver at some point during the season. Okay. We moved from Vancouver to Colorado where uh, the avalanche recently re-signed Devin Tays to a seven year deal with an AAV of 7.25 mil. That is a really good deal on the surface of things. How do you see it? It's a good deal, but I, I don't know. Like it was portrayed almost like the player took a bad deal. I, I, I don't think that's necessarily the case either. I mean, look, Devon Taves, he's, he's had a great impact since going to Colorado. It was a savvy trade uh, by the Avalanche to bring him in from the Islanders when the Islanders were at a sort of standstill and they couldn't pay him. Uh, he was part of their Stanley cup win. the, under the hood metrics are off the charts for Taves. And I, I think this is something they can, you know, there's no reason to see that falling off, but you know, you're signing a player well into his thirties now, by the time that that seven years plays out. Um, and I think there's benefit to getting it done early in the year. He would have been potential unrestricted free agent after the season. To me, they, they found a sort of a nice line down the middle where, you know, he, he's got financial security more than he's ever had. He gets to stay in a place that he and his family like to live play for a team that presumably will be, you know, trying to contend each of those seven years. I don't think the avalanche after signing, you know, Rantanen and McKinnon and all the players they have to long-term deals are planning on going anywhere anytime soon. And so I, I like the deal and, you know, it took a lot of back and forth. And I think they were trying to get it done over the summertime and, but ultimately get it done before, you know, really the season gets too deep in here. And, and so I see it as being almost a fair deal versus, you know, it just seemed to me there's some people portraying it like the, he could have got so, so much more on the open market. I, I, I'm not sure that's the case. I mean, offensive defensemen typically get rewarded to, you know, those kind of numbers. I mean, if you, if you look at the the top paid guys, you, you got Carlson, uh, you have Rasmus Dahlin now coming off his best offensive season. Obviously, Drew Doughty, who's been pretty prolific over his career. Um, you know, it's usually those type of players that, uh, you know, McCarr, you know, you have to think Makar was an internal. Like, there's no way he was going over Makar, right? So, you know, this is the sort of stuff that, that plays out over a negotiation. And, you know, I think they have arrived at a good number and, and should be a pretty good safe bet for the Avalanche moving into a period here where the cap's going to take a jump up. 
And uh, we'll wrap up this segment with uh, talk about uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois, who will return to Winnipeg for the first time since being traded uh, from the Winnipeg Jets to the Kings this offseason. We know he uh, made it clear he was going to try to take his his, uh, his talents somewhere else beyond Winnipeg. Uh, the situation resolved as it did. What do you what did you think of that entire situation? What do you think about him uh, on the eve of him returning to Winnipeg? Well, it might not be as big a deal for him because he's been through it before, right? I mean, this is a player who forced his way out of Columbus uh, once upon a time. And so he's he's kind of lived this before. I think that, you know, Pierre-Luc Dubois has landed somewhere he's happy. He signed an eight-year contract after that trade from Winnipeg. You know, he's found what he hopes to be his long-term home. I think that, you know, the Kings are sort of sneaky, loaded up the middle with him, Anze Kopitar, still performing at a pretty high level, and then Philip Deneau. And, you know, I think that that this is, you know, finally guys found a place that, he, that he's ready to call home. And so sure it'll be a little uncomfortable and would imagine he's going to get booed pretty well by the, the fans, just given that's how these things typically go. But, you know, I, I think it's, it's a situation that's worked out well. I thought the jets actually under some duress because, you know, everyone knew that there was, you know, basically one of two places he was going to sign, which would be LA or Montreal. Um, you know, it was, that's a, that can be a tough position to make a good trade. I think, I think Kevin shovel day off did a nice job on the deal for Dubois and, and, you know, the Jets have kind of moved on without him. He's moving on without them. And, you know, this will be a, a storyline for a day here or, or two as he as he plays that game and we see how everyone reacts. But, I, you know, I think long term that, that both parties might come out ahead because it just, just didn't end up being quite the perfect marriage. I mean, if you remember, the Dubois trade was made for Line A. Line A was having trouble in Winnipeg at the time. Dubois went out of Columbus. It was almost like trading two, you know, obviously players with tremendous upside, but two problems for each organization. Um, and I just feel like the fit was never quite right in Winnipeg, whereas I think uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois is going to have a lot more success as an, an L.A. King and having the stability he has there. All right. Uh, an already packed show will be capped with Ask CJ, where we take in questions off of Discord and Twitter for good old Siege. Are you ready to take in some questions? Ready to go. Hey, I do Let's know, by the way, we're going to do a mailbag oh. feature for me at The Athletic. So oh. Ask CJ. I don't know if it'll be called or branded Ask CJ, but Ask CJ will live on in some form at The Athletic once uh, once I get writing there. I love how Ask CJ went from some random idea that we just kind of threw out there for a podcast. It is now embedded in the hockey world. We did it, people. We're there. <laughs> That's the beauty of a podcast, right? It's like some certain things just take on a life of their own. You don't even know how. Like We just sit here and exchange ideas and goof around, and then some stuff sticks, right? Exactly. And it worked out. Uh, let's get to Congo Red's question. What is the best non-sports live event you have ever been to? Ooh. Best non-sports live event. I'm guessing it's a concert, but it could be like some type of festival or some other like, I don't know if you've been to like Cirque du Soleil or anything like that. Like, Well, as much as I want to say the Cultivate Festival in Coburg, <laughs> uh, where, I, where I once had the chance to be a celebrity judge alongside Fred Penner of the best butter tarts in the Coburg area. You should you actually to go to some context. You should have some context to some of these people. Cause I don't, I mean, well, that person anyway, I don't know. Who you don't know is. who Fred Penner is. I don't know who Fred Penner is. Legendary children's performer. Fred Penner. I don't put it this way. Is. When I did was a celebrity judge at the butter tart festival with Fred Penner, Fred Penner was getting more people asking for selfies. I mean, and, I, I, I have no doubt. And with good reason. Um, so as much as I want to say that event, and everyone should check out the Cultivate Festival in the Coburg area every September. My friend Jeff Bray and Nicole Beatty organized that. Mm -hmm. uh, I would probably say, uh, <laughs> I don't know why my brain went there. <laughs> You're just trying to flex. you just trying to flex. No. But hey, man, I, I, was, I, was, I was big shit at the Cultivate Festival. You know what I'm saying? You just it was actually, it. I get it. this is a true story. That was the first time I'd ever eaten a butter tart. And I was on stage, like in a live event, eating butter tarts and judging them. And I'd never had a butter tart in my life. Oh my God. <laughs> so I don't know if I was the best. Uh, I mean, That's I guess there's two situation. ways of looking at that. I didn't, I didn't yeah. come in with any preconceived notions of what a butter tart should be. So that, that exactly. That's the counter argument. Um, and I haven't eaten one since. And this was a few years ago. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> they didn't invite you back. No, I couldn't go this year, um, but I'd like to go. I'd like to be back. I'll say this. 
probably Lollapalooza. I went to Lollapalooza many years ago oh, in Chicago, really? and it was just an awesome weekend, like great weather and just banger bands like one after another for like three straight days um so i would say that's probably like off the top of my head the most memorable or best sort of concert experience i've had that was a long time ago i don't know if all the has crossed the shark maybe it's not as good nowadays um but 10 or 12 years ago that that was that was where it was at um but you know as you would imagine i don't get a chance to, i i love sports so I, I try to get to other sporting events and obviously go to a lot for work and, but I'm not, I'm not going to tons of concerts or things these days. Who did you go see at Lollapalooza? Um, well, it was a long time ago and that among the bands that were there, it was actually the first place I ever saw the national live and mm -hmm. the show the national put on that day was like, they had me for life after the way that show went. Um, but there was, I remember like metric was there, Love uh, the XX, uh, mm -hmm. stars. Um, oh man, you put me on the spot. There's... Here, let me see. Are you literally good? You're literally going to pull up the set list. Well, you're not the set list, up... but I, sorry, I, the poster, the poster. Yeah. Cause yeah, not set list. sorry. Cause I'll tell you, cause I didn't see every show. Right. I mean, no, but like, you can't see every single show at these festivals. The Strokes like, I went to, Arcade damn, Fire, damn. Uh, Phoenix, MGMT, Phoenix. the Black Keys was awesome. Um, it was really good, honestly. I just remember it was like, it just felt like one after another, and you're just sitting out there and like, frankly, like having some day drinks in a park in Chicago, like great weather. Like it was just, it was awesome. It was so much fun. Um, the other thing I'd say, I'm not too cultured, but I saw the play Hamilton in London, England, and that, that might be the other best non-sporting event, live event I've been to. I didn't know anything about Hamilton at the time. Like I was, I was aware that it was a social phenomenon, but I just like went yeah. and it was a, awesome. Like, like I remember like the first, the show opens and like they get through like the first act and I was like, holy crap, like this is awesome. Uh, to the point that, like, sometimes I'll even just put on the music now because it reminds me of of the, the play. So, like, that was – to see that, like, literally a, a few blocks from Buckingham Palace in the theater there was pretty cool, too. Those are some really great answers. I dig that. That's really cool. But also, also the Cultivate I, Fester yeah. in Coburg. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We have to plug the Cultivate Festival in Coburg. Um, how about this one from uh, Lady underscore Lori underscore QC, which I think she's just Lori. Uh, what's happening with Kirby Doc in Montreal? He suffered a big injury uh, over the weekend. Nothing good, unfortunately. You know, Kirby Doc, I, I actually was at the game opening night in Toronto for the Habs, and he was he might have been the best player on the ice. Certainly his line had a huge impact on that game. And unfortunately for him, you know, a player who's dealt with injuries too much early in his NHL career, you know, it sounds like he's going to be out, you know, for quite a long time. And so I, I don't have the exact nature of that injury uh, to, to share here, but, but unfortunately I don't think we're going to see him play for a long period of time. And I just think that's, that's too bad because, you know, you're talking about a player, the Canadians are obviously hoping to take a you know, take future further steps to, to be a part of their team as they become more competitive and move into a window where they're challenging for a playoff spot. And this is another big setback for him personally. Uh, from Chris Thorn art on Twitter uh, or X, however you choose to call the app. Uh, two games in, and the LA Kings goaltending situation has me more worried than ever. What do you think, and are you hearing any rumblings? No specific rumblings just yet. I think it's early, but it's also notable, Julian, how many teams are carrying three goaltenders right now. And I think teams are wary of potential waiver claims. And, and you know, if if things go a certain way in LA, I mean, I, I think that they could be one of the teams looking for an upgrade there. And so we've seen a number of teams – protect their assets. Uh, I'm thinking off the top of my head, Detroit, Buffalo, Montreal still has Caden Primo. Uh, Philadelphia is carrying three goaltenders right now. And last I looked, the Colorado Avalanche also had three goaltenders. That's way more than normal. I mean, there's only two nets on the ice, right? At practice, yeah. in the game, but we'll go back to practice. Like it's hard to have three goaltenders, even just from a, a practical standpoint to make sure that they're all getting in the kind of work they need on a daily basis 
And so teams typically really do not want to carry three goalies. Um, but at least in the case of a couple of those teams, they'd have to pass a player through waivers. And I think that there's genuine reason for concern that those players wouldn't get through waivers. And so I'd say right now the goalie market's just kind of jammed up. Like, like I think something almost has to happen where maybe a team, you know, it could be in LA. I, I don't, I don't think that's happening just yet, but in LA is makes a trade. Um, but right now I certainly know there's a few front offices trying to protect their goalie assets and not wanting to put those players on waivers. And in part it's because, I think there's a lot of unsettled creases around the league. Uh, last one from uh, the actual Puck Doku account uh, was in the mentions. Uh, who's going to have it. a better Puck Doku game? I I like my odds. I I, I got to say I like my board, man. I mean, I don't I don't know what you're going to come up with. I don't. You've probably you've been busy too. The season's just starting. I don't know if you've even put thought into it yet because you get to go week two. But um, yesterday, among everything, my birthday. You know, I ran a half marathon on Sunday too. So I was getting some glow yes, from that. Then, thank you. The athletic announcement. There's a lot going on, but partly what was occupying my brain was, man, I got to come up with a good puck doku board. And uh, I'm happy with what I submitted. So I, I like my odds of um, having a low uniqueness score tomorrow when the game's out. And I want to see how many of you, please hit me up at reporter. Chris can figure out what the sort of theme or what, what I was doing with that board, how I arrived at the six items I put in the order that I put them in. I thought about my board a couple of weeks ago when this idea first materialized and I've been meaning to go back to that idea. There's one particular category I really want in this and I'm really hoping you didn't put it in yours. I don't think you did, but I'm really hoping you didn't put it in yours. I'll say this without giving anything away. I didn't go too off the board with my categories. I was more trying to arrange the categories with a certain theme in mind. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, I didn't like come up and I play, as I've said, I play basically yes. every day. I've missed the odd day, but like I'm, you know, I've seen the odd time they go, they'll introduce a new category that you haven't really seen before. I didn't, I didn't strive to do that. It was more about finding a unique way to arrange teams and categories to produce certain answers. It's going to be fun. We should uh, hopefully the SDP boys know what's up and uh, we should try to get them to do both of our quizzes on their shows. I would love for them to do that. Carve out a couple. Yeah. Minutes. I'm uh, I'm going to put that in the group chat today. So hopefully Steve, Adam and Jesse are paying attention. I don't, they might get tired of our group chat. I wish, I wish our hardest core listeners could be in the group chat sometimes. Cause like it's, it is pure nonsense. I mean, sometimes it's just practical like me, you and Nick going like, Hey, are you available at this time tomorrow? Yeah. It's sort of, sort of what you'd expect. But then there's a lot of times like I can't even keep up with what the hell's going on in there. There's some gems dropped in that in that chat. I'm sure like if you let like one of the the 100 percenters in there and just let them hang out for like 24 hours, they would just be amazed. At the I stuff like that gets dropped in there. I like when the, when Drew drops in, like I feel like he's yeah. always he's not a regular like he doesn't get in the mix on everything, but he's always just lurking in the background, ready to like drop some chaos in there. That seems to just be his mo. Like it's if he can't just be a sensible person about anything. Yeah, yeah that whole I take on Thanksgiving about beets being better than like cranberry sauce or something. Like th that's not a sensible person. Well, if anyone, if you've listened to the Drew and Stu show, I mean, you get a you get a flavor for for what Drew's all about. But yeah, he's he's. Uh, I just love when I see Drew in there I'm like uh oh what yeah, what's coming next like what like what kind of lightning is going to rain from the sky right now yeah uh maybe we'll have a contest one day we'll let one of our listeners hang out in the group chat for like 24 hours before we boot them out. <laughs> that might we'll be a punishment that. not a, not a you know a victory <laughs> <laughs> take all the notifications uh thank you all so much for tuning in for today's edition of the cj show we'll be back on thursday with stick taps and more storylines to digest uh, happy birthday again, CJ. Uh, in, I, I hope you enjoyed the Monday. I hope you enjoy another spin around the sun. And congratulations again on joining the best team uh, in hockey when it comes to coverage, which is the athletic. Got to show Thank you some love. You. Thanks, bud. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Honestly, it uh, means a lot to us. I'm CJ, I'm Julian. So long. Peace. The Chris Johnson Show. Powered by Sports Interaction, your homegrown sports book. Always remember to bet local. Inside the game, twice a week. Follow Chris on Twitter, at Reporter Chris. And follow Julian McKenzie, at JK and McKenzie. The Chris Johnston Show.